My name is Cy Gart. I'll be moderating this uh, session. Our first speaker is Alan Dicken. Uh, he will be talking on new insights into the biblical accounts of uh, creation require a better understanding of their ancient historical setting. So I wanted to uh, address the question posed by the theology question posed by the program committee. Are there new insights that might inform ongoing controversy surrounding biblical accounts of creation and scientific concepts of evolution, astronomy, and geology? And my answer is to gain new insights, the greatest need is a better understanding of the historical context of the creation stories. In other words, where did they come from? And one of the issues I want to raise is the issue of testability or falsifiability, if you like. Ideally, scientific theories should make predictions, models, or interpretations that are falsifiable. The problem with most interpretations of the Genesis creation stories is that they're not testable in this way. In contrast, theories of the origins of these accounts are much more likely to be testable. So knowing the origins of an account will then strongly constrain its interpretation. So this approach should put the analysis of the creation accounts on a more scientific basis, speaking as a scientist rather than a theologian, or an amateur theologian if you prefer. So um, a brief summary of the evidence for ancient Mesopotamian, by which I mean pre-exilic, pre-Babylonian exile material in Genesis. So Genesis 2 is set in Mesopotamia. We have the rivers named. Noah's flood was in Mesopotamia. It was fairly clearly a river flood. The seven-day week comes from Mesopotamia, the duration of the flood. The Tower of Babel was in Mesopotamia, the plain of Shinar. Abraham came from Mesopotamia, from Ur the Chaldees. The divine name El comes from Mesopotamia, um, the god Elil. I need to say here that what we're speaking of here is a whole, a whole world. Um, some say a lost world. Well, I prefer not to say lost world because the whole the objective is to recover this world, but a whole world. So all I could possibly do in quarter of an hour is to give you a few snapshots, and that's all it will be. But I mean, the amount of evidence is actually enormous. So I will summarize here what... Um, uh, Albright said his, his interpretation, much of the early high culture of the Hebrews, as preserved in the books of Genesis and Exodus, rarely elsewhere, contains elements brought from Mesopotamia during the time of the patriarchs, that is, no later than the 16th century BC. So that's the kind of background, and you could say I'm going to try to support that, um, continue that belief. So one of the main things I want to argue is the centrality of the flood in ancient history. This is maybe a list of assertions which I will hope to at least partly substantiate. A correct understanding of Noah's Ark and Noah's flood is central for understanding early biblical history. The date of the flood anchors Sumerian history. The reed hut on the ark is the archaic Sumerian sanctuary, and the flood inspired the Genesis 1 creation story. So I'll hope to um, support some of these assertions at least. So um, let me begin um, with the Sumerian king list. This is the well Blundell prism from the Ashmolean uh, Museum, Oxford. Dates from around 1700 BC. And this particular item, actually, is often used to date the flood to 2900 BC. And I've shown on the right here a summary of the beginning of the king list. And you see there, there are five dynasties uh, five antediluvian dynasties that ruled before the flood. Then the flood swept over, as it says, 
in the on the document. And then we have post-Diluvian dynasties, beginning with the first dynasty of Kish and then Uruk. And there's a whole bunch of others which I've left off because you know, I don't have space for them all. However, the antediluvian section is not historically attested. In reality, Uruk was the dominant world power for 500 years before Kish, so it should be listed as one of the antediluvian dynasties on the top right there. In fact, the earliest version of the king list from around 2100 BC, that is to say 400 years earlier than the well blundled prism, lacks the antediluvian section or even in fact any mention of the flood at all. So the antediluvian section is a later prequel added basically to give um, gravitas to the king list, which is essentially a piece of political propaganda anyway. It's not historically accurate. So the only thing that the king list can actually tell us about the flood is that it was before Kish one. In other words, earlier than 2900, but it could be any time before that. Let's look, turn to some other evidence for the date of the flood. So we can look at paleoclimate evidence. This is the climatic record in a cave stalactite from near Jerusalem, which is part of the Fertile Crescent and therefore relevant. The high delta carbon-13 isotope ratios on the y-axis indicate a, quote, deluge period around 6000 BC, which is, um, eight, whoops, oh dear, which is 8,000, eight, uh, eight kilo years before present. That the graph is in before present because it's just like science rather than archaeology. But okay, so um, these signatures. This is not a good idea. These signatures, which is labeled there S1, are unique in the last 60,000 years, as you can see on the, the x axis. The word deluge was used by these authors without any reference to Noah's flood, but to describe the fact that this was a period of intense rainfall and intense flooding, which the, these floods entered the cave, which is why it's in the cave uh, stalactite. And severe river flooding at this time formed a PT sapropel layer, as it's called, in fleece seafloor sediments which is called S1. Other sapropels are much older than this. Now I, look, now I want to look at um, a cross-section of river gorges cut into the Mesopotamian, Mesopotamian plain. During the Ice Age, sea, was, sea level was much lower. After the Ice Age, the rivers were confined to gorges which, um, actually I will point to this. When it, this, this is a gorge here. And by the way, this graph has vertical exaggeration, but th that's normal. Um, rising sea level after the ice age filled the gorges initially with water, and then once it's filled with water, it immediately gets filled with sediment also. So what that means is, if you look at the far um, right-hand side here, yeah, those are the radiocarbon ages. And from 5600 BC onwards, the gorges will be full up, and therefore that a river flood can now flood over the whole plain and give rise to catastrophic flooding. Um, and we can also see very like a candidate for the flood horizon in boreholes at the city of Uruk. So we have continuous human occupation at Uruk, which goes back to 5000 BC. That's a radiocarbon date. And also we can see uh, the, the little black dots are pottery sherds, and you can see a continuous occupation. Below the earliest occupation level, a PT layer probably represents the flood sap propel at around 5,600 BC, which is late Neolithic. 
Now, some other, some um, literary evidence for the, an early flood, a Neolithic flood. For example, the belief in the biblical text <coughs> that all Middle Eastern peoples were descended from Noah, which must mean that the flood would have to be in the distant past, because otherwise it would not be credible that all Middle Eastern peoples had time to, to spread from Noah. And then in the Mesopotamian stories, the flight hero is living in a reed hut, not in a brick-built house. That's other evidence of its early date. Now, this is a, an example of modern reed-built architecture. And I want you to note, because I'm going to come back to this, that the, um, the framework of this, uh, this house, this mudhif, uh, consists of reed bundles bound together with uh, horizontal reed bands. And then at the far end, we see uh, reed, we see pillars built of reed bundles. So, how to build a Neolithic Ark? We have evidence for this from built boat building practices in Iraq from the 19th century. Boats like small arcs were built from crude logs lashed together with palm rope. This structure was covered in molten pitch from local tar seeps to give strength and buoyancy. This is an incredibly primitive method, but also surprisingly effective. And we can actually read about the actual structure of the Ark Raft, as I'll call it, in the recently discovered Ark Tablet. Uh, there was a TV documentary written about, uh, made about this, but in fact, frankly, they completely misinterpreted the um, the tablet, which is a shame because the guy, Finkel, is a a uh, cuneiform expert, but I think he clearly misread it. Um, the Ark tablet describes a wooden framework similar to the 19th century Iraqi rafts, and I've shown a, a sort of a part of this as a plan form here, and as a cross section here. Um, 3,600 cross beams were lashed to 30 main ribs with palm fiber rope. The giant raft framework was caught with palm fiber and then sealed with a huge amount of molten pitch, 270 cubic meters of pitch, which is around 70,000 gallons of pitch was used. Um, if you look at the cross section, the main rib is at the bottom, which is out of the line of section. And then across that, we have these, the uh, cross beams and then the... Um, the caulking and the pitch on top. And the result, if you add a little bit of sand into the pitch, of course, you get asphalt. So you basically get a giant asphalt raft, one acre in area. That's the size of the art described in the Mesopotamian accounts. And you could obviously get a large flock of animals on that. And it would look a bit like this. These are actually modern islands um, made by filling... Um, a framework of, uh, of reeds with mud, but the, 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 the original floating art would have looked very similar. It was basically a floating farm. It was never a container ship. And this could have been built in the Neolithic. However, that's just the beginning of the story. So here's the one, maybe, you know, the principal question. Where was God between the time of Noah and Abraham? Which, in fact, is... For nearly 4,000 years. Genesis 9.8 says, Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you. So Noah's descendants clearly founded biblical religion. And I'm going to argue that Sumerian literature and iconography link later temple architecture with the reed hut shrine on the ark. Okay, so on the left here, you can see um, a schematic of, a, of a, uh, a raft with a framework of a reed hut on it. And hopefully you can see we have the, um, here's the framework. We have horizontals here, which might have supported decks or something. And they are joined to the verticals with hoops made of reeds or, or rings or hoops. And in the middle picture there, you can see uh, an early uh, stone, a broken stone bowl uh, from more than 3000 BC from near Ur. 
and uh, you can see the reed hut at the bottom, and you can see now that the, um, the reed pillars have been extended out above the uh, reed hut, and also that the loops are now made into what you might call an ornamental element. The loop, the, 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 the um, series of six rings. And you can see, however, that the pillars are reeds because they have the horizontal bands on them. And when we move to the right and we see what's clearly a brick-built temple, it maintains the symbolism from the earlier street hut by having the reed pillars next to the temple with the loops at the top. And you can see quite clearly they have the reed bands around them showing that these, bundle, these are still bundles of reeds. And these re ringed reed pillars also form part of sacred architecture. In other words, they're not just in, illustration, in iconography, they're actual real architectural elements. On the left is a limestone model of a temple from more than, yeah, around 3500 BC. It has single ring pillars marking the entrance to the temple, two of them. You can, they're broken, but you can see where the rings would have been quite, quite clearly. On the right is a full-sized architectural element, which was three meters tall. Uh, it's been squashed to get it in the picture, but it once stood as, as a single pillar with a, re, with a ring on one side. Um, and it was made of copper-covered wood. Of course, the wood's rotted away, and what we're left with is a large tube um, you know, like 15 centimeters across, which the, the copper tube was um, enclosed the wood. Those, I can, th those architectural and iconographical elements are from like early in Mesopotamian history. But now I want to look back um, from the end of Sumerian history. And the evidence here, I'm going to say, that it shows that the Sumerians preserved the biblical religion that was first revealed to Noah after the flood. So we're going to look backwards uh, over this 4,000 year period by looking at the stela of Hammurabi, which is on the right. So in the middle there, you can see the whole stela. It's two meters high diorite steel in the Louvre. And the right hand side is an enlargement of the top of it. And in that picture, you can see uh, Hammurabi receiving the um, ringed rod symbol of authority from the sun god. And you can see it's the sun god because he has the uh, flames rising from his shoulders. And this, oh, sorry. And then below that, in, you can see a grid there, and that contains the um, inscription. And um, this inscription attempts to justify the ascendancy of Babylon's god Marduk by arguing that the chief god of the Sumerian pantheon voluntarily gave Marduk rulership over mankind. Of course, this is a straight out lie, but sometimes it's a piece of political propaganda, but it can be also very revealing. So I want to actually show you the beginning of the the inscription here, the prologue to Hammurabi's law code. The inscription is written in Akkadian cuneiform, in other words, Semitic language, and it's, this is demonstrated by the use of Semitic words, such as Shamu. So I'm going to read the inscription at the bottom there, if I can. When Anne, the lofty one, king of the divine Anunnaki and divine Enlil, lord of heaven and earth, who decreed the fates of the land, gave to divine Marduk, chief son of divine Enki, the divine El El Enlil functions over all mankind, and so on. Um, now, if you look at the, uh, uh, sorry, the gray, the gray uh, box there. Yeah, okay. The gray box there. The top says Baal, Baal. And then the bottom three characters are the phonetic spelling of Shamu, which is, as I say, the Akkadian word for heaven. But if you look at the blue, pink, and yellow, those are the Sumerian names of the Sumerian triad, the Sumerian trinity. And the blue, the star sign, 
in Sumerian is the word an, and that means heaven. So only in Sumerian does the phonetic word an mean heaven, i.e. Uh, I, the god of heaven, as illustrated by the star sign. And the god of heaven is attested in Daniel chapter 2 as the true god. In comparison, the green shows Marduk, and those signs there mean the bull calf of the sun. The, the, uh, you can see a schematic illustration of a bull's head. The horns are very short. And then we have the sun. It's a picture of the sun rising above the horizon at the bottom there. So what this says is Marduk is the bull calf of the sun. But when you read the inscription, it says Marduk was the chief son of Enki. So this is, as I said, a straight out lie. Obviously, Marduk was actually an offspring of the sun god. It's got nothing to do with the god Enki, but this is all part of the political propaganda. So finally, the cosmic temple model of Genesis 1. Uh, Walton argued that Genesis 1 describes the inauguration of the heavens and the earth as a cosmic temple. The question is, what temple inspired this metaphor? Genesis 1 is used in the fourth commandment given at Sinai as the basis for the Sabbath. So if Genesis 1 preceded Sinai, it must have it's been inspired by an earlier, most likely a Mesopotamian temple. So this is um, basically my rethinking of Genesis 1 and 2. Genesis 2, the story of Adam and Eve, was the original creation story. This story was passed down orally and carried by Noah on the ark. Noah could not have transmitted two contradictory oral traditions about creation, so the creation story in Genesis 1 must have originated after the flood. Strong parallels between Genesis 1 and Genesis 8 suggest that Genesis 1 was inspired by recreation after the flood. So it probably represents a series of visions received um, by a priest in a Sumerian temple context. So I'm just going to finish here by saying, um, for further reading, uh, on the left-hand side is, uh, is my book, um, which really gives a full account of this whole story. On the right-hand side is a paper um, published by the Australian Iscast Is Journal, SIPOSAT, which is Christian Perspectives on Science and Technology, and this is a paper that specifically makes the case of how Genesis 1 was inspired by uh, a vision of the flood. Thank you. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the, uh, for, uh, some of the work put forth by Harold Hill in uh, her interpretation of flood held by others of a say a flood roughly around 3000 BC and with at least the ark being moved surprisingly far to the north to land somewhat in accordance with the uh, Ararat viewpoint but not so far as there you know uh, other mountains up there that or that vicinity, uh, perhaps about where the Tigris River uh, comes out of the uh, Taurus Mountains. Mm -hmm. And so also just thinking about animals that Noah had. Here I'm thinking, yes, I'm thinking particularly about livestock. And I've looked at uh, particularly goats and sheep. If I look at goats, goats and sheep that are particularly of interest, particularly of Noah's descendants, uh, going west, southeast, southwest, that those probably came from eastern Iran, or western Iran, excuse me. And then you can trace where they were going westward. And uh, there I think the dates had lined up better with... Uh, maybe 3000 BC. Yeah. yeah, so the question was, what, what is your view on 
uh, yeah, alternative view. And I, I've, I've read your your books, and I quite for you. I thank you for those. But do you think that the arc moving to the north is still a possibility? I think maybe the hour rats part is out of, uh, there isn't time to go into that, but I, I would li like to say yes. So the um, the time of the domestication of sheep and goats is somewhere around 9,000 BC. So we've got vast amounts of time uh, to play with between that and the time of the flood. That's not an issue. Um, the question about the date of the flood, apart from the scientific evidence, is just that it's simply not credible that there was a flood at 3000 BC that justifies the biblical account of complete and utter annihilation of mankind so that the earth was wiped clean because 3000 BC was a time already of the early almost empires. I mean, large city-states with city walls clearly developed. Um, it's not the picture presented in the Bible at all, it, it, in fact, yes, it just, it just does not fit with the biblical picture of a flood that was early in prehistory. Do, do most of the criminals work on the same thing? What was your specific disagreement with him on the size of the boat? Please repeat the question. Okay, so Irving Finkel, uh, he, he translated the Ark tablet, and then he, in a documentary, he tried to uh, build a smaller version of uh, the, the Ark as a coracle. Um, well, firstly, his, the, this demonstration clearly failed in the sense that he proved quite categorically that a coracle-type Ark cannot be scaled up to the size that would be necessary. I mean, basically, his arc sank. They kept it afloat with a high-powered mechanical pump. So this was not really a demonstration of success. Having then looked into the, the, the words used in the tablet, the critical word is the word stanchion. And he argues that a stanchion is a vertical support between the bottom deck, as it were, and the top deck of the arc. But in actual fact, the usage of the word stanchion, well, obviously that's an English translation. The word that is translated stanchion can mean a horizontal support, and it much better describes the, these 3,600 stanchions. Frankly, when they're, when they're vertical, like pit props, it's, the, the, the picture is completely absurd. Whereas when they, they're seen as horizontal supports of the the, uh, the pitch, the, the asphalt deck, then it all falls into place. Let's thank Alan again.